Stanford University. This is a daunting assignment. Um, I, I, I'm, I wanted to be a little bit modular, and so I'll ask the magic question. If you are from science or engineering, raise your hand. Great, wonderful. I've, I will keep in that part because I, my, my understanding after having talked to a bunch of my colleagues who teach writing in the major courses um, is that the hardest disciplines uh, in which to have meaningful writing in the major uh, assignments is science and engineering. Not all science and engineering, but there are areas. And so um, I, I, would, I think economics is easier to produce good essay assignments, uh, but uh, there are problems there as well. Because, and I'll get into why there's problems, because uh, I have a different take on why you do essay assignments than I think most academics do. I used to do it the way everybody does it. Uh, every course I ever taught for the first 10 or 15 years of teaching, I assigned a term paper. That is the, the standard modality. If you, uh, early on in the quarter, sometime in the first uh, four weeks or so, you start talking to students about the necessity of picking a term paper topic, uh, doing a lot of out-of-class research. The nature of the research, of course, varies from discipline to discipline. It can be um, uh, collecting data. It can be reading novels. It can be um, doing experiments in a laboratory. But the important point is that the, the, the term paper typically is more than just a regurgitation of classroom material. It is something beyond that where its purpose is not just to demonstrate some knowledge learned in the course, but also to demonstrate research skills. And then at the end of the quarter, uh, usually uh, dead week or finals week, a tome is delivered, uh, something that's 25 or 30 pages long with lots of references. And uh, you tell the students all along, and you give them some advice, that one of the reasons for us making this assignment is you want to help them develop their writing skills. But the, the problem is that term papers are really not a great vehicle for the last objective. They're a terrific vehicle for getting people to apply their knowledge in an in-depth way. They're a terrific vehicle for getting people to organize their research. And they're also a pretty good vehicle for causing them to sit down and think logically about the topic that they picked. But they're really a poor vehicle for actually teaching people writing skills. Um, for many, many years, until one of my heroes, Claude, showed up, uh, Stanford labored under the, uh, the same illusion that every other university I've ever taught at or been a student at labored under, uh, which is that it's the job of the freshman instructors to teach people writing skills. Okay, you let them take some composition courses in their freshman year, um, and pretty much that's it. They uh, pop out of those courses uh, as some sort of combination of uh, Scotty Restrin and, and Ernest Hemingway, and, <laughs> and they're ready to go. They're ready to write term papers in everything from French literature to theoretical physics. Okay, and uh, that is completely. Uh, erroneous. I mean, I, my my experience of uh, of, of all the of, with all students is that on the one hand, the freshman composition courses teach them a lot. On the other hand, they teach them almost nothing about any given subject mode of expression, other than the one of the instructor. All right. That is to say, it's not realistic for me if I'm teaching freshman composition to teach people the appropriate modes of expression in French literature. Likewise, it's not really appropriate to expect someone who is a professor of French literature to teach people the modes of expression in economics. It's just not true. It's not going to happen. And there, there is, there's an enormous variety in what the point of an essay is across the discipline, uh, from really very simplistic, as short, as you possibly can explain a research result, present a research result, um, uh, which is characteristic of some of the science disciplines, not all of them, uh, all the way to the essay may be about 
a scholarly topic, but it's really about you revealing some sort of creativity in your writing ability, uh, you know, sort of the, the extreme of the, of the uh, sort of Yale school about, about literary scholarship that emerged in the 70s. So what I think is neat about Stanford is the writing of the major program because it accepts the reality that the development of writing skills is something that is multidimensional and has to be built on continuously through time. And indeed, it doesn't stop when you graduate. Uh, if you're in a field like ours, uh, if you're in a profession like ours, you know that every time you write the first draft of anything, you have to hand it to a colleague. Because the colleague will look at it, and about page three, they'll start to giggle and say, you said that, right? <laughs> and so no matter how long you do it, you can do it until you're as old as I am, there's still a big difference between the first draft and the second draft that pertains not just to the research matter, the purpose of the essay from the standpoint of getting it in a journal or getting a book published by a scholarly press, but in the mode of expression itself, in perfecting the way of explaining what you're doing to others. So the bottom line to it is, given that writing skills have values for us as scholars, given that they have values for all kinds of professions and in life, uh, people are constantly being put in the position of writing something uh, where they're trying to explain themselves, their ideas, what they've done to somebody else. Um, I think the separation of the research component in term papers from the writing skills acquisition process is extremely valuable and important. And consequently, just before I came to Stanford, about two or three years before I came to Stanford, circa 1980, uh, I taught a course at Caltech that was very similar to the one I teach at, Ca at Stanford, an interdisciplinary course in public policy making with the emphasis on decision making. All right, that's my course. My course is how do people in the public sector make decisions given economic reality and political constraints. That, and that's, that's the basic story of my course. Uh, I started the process of doing what pretty much the writing of the major program now insists that every major do. Uh, every other week, I assigned a uh, term paper. Um, originally, I, I called it uh, um, a memo to your congressman. Um, Chip Blacker, incidentally, in, the, in IIS, uh, has a similar strategy in his course. He calls it a memo to the president. His topic is national security, and he gives you something that about uh, country A has just invaded country B, and there's 150 Americans stuck in the embassy, and they can't get out because they're surrounded by machine gun fire. What do you do? Uh, mine is uh, primarily oriented towards domestic policy making. But there's some international policy making as well. But it's the same basic idea. Uh, a very short, well-defined question. But the important fact about it is that the students don't have to do any research. What you do is you do the research yourself. Okay? You generate the material for them and write it down in a couple of pages. I th you know, and this is what I think the beauty of of doing this in science and engineering would be. Um, the act of writing a brief paper, three to five pages, describing a technical fact in science or engineering, or describing an experiment in a way that somebody could understand who is not capable of performing that experiment or is not capable of doing the research necessary to come up with that technical fact would be the counterpart. Uh, the examples of people who do this for a living, of course, are science writers. Just a couple of days ago, I, I was meeting to bring it today, then I forgot, but I forgot. The New York Times celebrated the 25th anniversary of Science Times, which is the weekly supplement that deals with uh, basically science issues, uh, reporting on scientific research. And um, I, if you're in a scientist, when I, and even if you're not, I strongly advise you to read at least part of it. What they did is they uh, um, polled some people in science and engineering, primarily academics, what are the 25 most important unanswered questions in science today? And then they assigned that topic to various writers to write a brief essay. I think the essays typically take up 
a quarter to a third of the page of science time. So they're exactly the kind of assignment you would give as one of these, term, these, one of these weekly assignments that I was talking about. And they range all the way from incredibly good, that is to say, you don't need to, there's one that's really excellent about the first, the first millionth of a second of the universe, right, uh, by a physicist, which is just brilliant. You know, you don't have to understand anything about quarks and strings and all the rest of the interesting stuff going on in physics to actually understand what the issue is, right? It's brilliant. On the other hand, there are a couple of others that are just god-awful. They're either god-awful because they're not written in a way that anybody other than a person in the field could understand it, or they're god-awful in the sense that the person couldn't resist the temptation to express their normative views uh, on some policy issue related to science. All right? And that isn't what you're really trying to teach in anything but a philosophy course or some course where the, the object of the game is value. Uh, what, we're, what I try to do in my class, and I, I'm going to show you, I have a handout here uh, to give you, is uh, I, you know, I, I tell students at the beginning, I don't care what your personal political ideology is. I don't care how you feel on the hot button issues of the day, like, um, like abortion, right to choose, right to life. I don't care how you feel about uh, the Bush tax cut. Uh, uh, the normative presuppositions you come, come here, I know you're not going to be able to escape them entirely, but your job is to deal with this question in the straightest possible way, descriptive accuracy and logic, laying out alternatives, laying out alternative decisions people might take based on the information that we have without sticking your personality into it, which is impossible, but nonetheless you can make the effort. So what the, what the assignment is then, for these students is here's somewhere between a half a page and three pages of facts. Now, some of the times I make them up. Um, there, I don't know if I, I, I have something I'm going to hand out to you. Uh, the, one of the ones I made up once was uh, the, uh, so someone having disco discovered that there was a chemical out there that was causing increased incidence of hangnails. And so I made up a bunch of facts and asked them to put us all together as to whether we should ban the chemical, right? And uh, the, imp the significance of the, of the issue was going to be, of course, that something as trivial as a hangnail, if you actually figured out why you got them and it was really cheap to cure it, you'd, you'd, you'd do it, right? Uh, likewise, there's other questions in there, uh, things as serious as certain kinds of cancer. Uh, if you really have poor information and it's astronomically expensive, you wouldn't do them no you despite the significance of it. So in any case, that's what induced hangnail syndrome was about. But the point, the point of the example is sometimes I make it up. Most often, however, I derive the information from uh, research. I journal articles, uh, books, published by scholars, uh, and sort of boil down the essential facts uh, and sort of give the students most but not all of the analytic methodology of the course that's relevant to writing the essay. In other words, the time of the student is a scarce, precious resource. If you assign an essay assignment where a large fraction of the amount of time available to the student in the time constraint of your course is devoted to solving the problem, uh, that is to say gathering data, and developing the logic of the argument, or the appropriate method, I shouldn't say the logic, because that should be part of the assignment, but the appropriate methodological approach to the problem. If they devote a lot of time to that, they don't have a lot of time to writing. Uh, my course is five units, which means 15 hours a week of assignments. Uh, that's my budget. I make them come to class five hours, uh, five of those hours. I assign them reading. Uh, that takes them another five hours. So I've got five hours a week of their time to be spent doing homework. Uh, my course is quantitative. It has lots of problems, like a science or engineering course would have. Uh, so at least two or three of those hours have got to be devoted to doing problems. So now I'm down to two or three hours of writing the essay. Uh, I don't want them to be doing research for that essay. I'm going to use the problems to test their ability to pick out the right formulas and pick out the right theoretical models or the right statistical arguments to deal with a problem. 
All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give that to them on the essays because what I want them to do is spend that entire two to three hours thinking about writing two or three pages. Right? And that's the objective. Develop the writing skill. But then the other important fact is I said I assign these things every two weeks. Um, they have to do it twice because the first, the first isn't graded. Uh, the first is, is nothing but a vehicle for making red marks on a piece of paper, which the red marks are both the substantive content and all the classic things that we think about grading in a composition kit. You know, the style, the grammar, the punctuation, all that stuff. But, the, but by far the most important in that is, did you write this in the mode of expression of the discipline that I am trying to teach? Uh, in my case, policy analysis, did you use the terminology and the methods of analysis and the methods of approach to a problem that are the conventional modes of communication in among the people who do this for a living? All right. And now, the, the, the experience I have with this is that um, the first essay assignment uh, they don't know this, and if you tell them, I will be very angry with you. The first essay assignment is almost never included in the final grade. And that's because the median grade is typically somewhere between a D and a C minus. And why is it between a D and a C minus? Not because Stanford students can't write. Not because Stanford students aren't smart. It's because Stanford students, in their first assignment ever in an economics course, where they had to do this, have no clue how to do it. All right? They have no clue how to write a nice, punchy thousand words to explain a specific point. They don't know how to do it. And you get, you know, failure mode number one. The person who thinks that he's writing a short story. Or the person who thinks that she is writing an opinion uh, article uh, uh, on the op op-ed side of the New York Times. In other words, strong advocacy of a, posi of a position. And uh, so those, those typically get a lot of red marks. No, I don't care what your opinion is. Uh, no, if you took an entire paragraph to make a point that could have been said in a five-word sentence, that left you with not enough words uh, to convey the essence of what you're trying to say in two or three pages. Now, um, I know lots of people in other disciplines would say, well, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't, tr shouldn't try to suppress their creativity. And I don't think of it as suppressing their creativity. I think of it as I am trying to achieve a certain number of academic ends here uh, that I think it's useful for everyone to have. It's even useful for someone who is a professor of creative writing at Stanford to be able to have this skill when writing a committee report for the faculty senate. All right, and this is that um, the essay assignment is supposed to be precise to the point. Something that John Hennessy reads when he asks somebody on his staff to crystallize a problem he faces for him. He is not interested in when he, when he asks the question, you know, or, or back to the Gerhard Tas Casper days. This is actually one of my former essay assignments. Recall the hospital merger. Uh, anybody who hasn't lived on Mars in the last few years knows that Stanford went through a debacle uh, with merging its hospitals with UC San Francisco's hospitals. And then it was a debacle. And... Uh, the question before the house that was posed to Gerhard Casper was, of course, how do we extricate ourselves from this? Well, that was one of my essay assignments in my class. I gave them all the facts and said, what do you do? Right? Well, when Gerhard would have asked, uh, at that time, I believe, Peter Van Etten was the uh, person in charge of the hospital system at Stanford. When he asked Peter, tell me what went wrong and how we're going to get out of this or fix it. He isn't expecting the great American novel in response, right? Uh, he's also not, not expecting Peter, who is perfectly capable of doing this, 
of writing a 30-page academic journal article on the management of hospitals. All right? That's not what he's expecting. What he's expecting is, I'm a lawyer who studies German constitutional law. I don't know much about medicine. I don't know much about the financial details of running a hospital. But I'm responsible for this as the CEO of Stanford University. Explain it to me. And explain it to me in the amount of time I have, because simultaneously 19 students are occupying my office asking for increases in scholarships. 47 faculty are yelling me at the faculty senate because the pay raises weren't big enough this year. And the gardeners are on strike. And I have to deal with all that today as well as the hospital. All right, so the, the, the game here is short, succinct, to the point, learn precise, state, learn precise methods of, of stating and describing and analyzing problems. The second important function, I think, of these, of these short essay assignments focused on a particular question is that they actually really solidify understanding. One of the things that I have learned, and I'm sure you've learned, is if you know, say, how do you really learn a topic? How do you really learn something? Well, you don't learn it sitting in a classroom listening to a lecturer, right? That sort of gets you started. By far and away, the best way to learn something is to try to teach it. All right? I mean, I, no, I noticed about 15 heads went, yeah, yeah, yeah. You just never, you know, until you stand up in front of a bunch of people and try to explain even the simplest thing, you know, um, you suddenly discover, you know, there are parts of this that I'm really not in control of, and I have to think about it more carefully before I try to, to explain it to somebody else. And, uh, and you know that, that if 15 students come into your office after you've handed out an assignment or given some particularly hard reading, and they come in to ask you questions about it, the answers you give to the 15th are a lot better than the answers you give to the first. Right? Because the very act of trying to explain it, trying to put it into ordinary language, causes you to learn it better. And that's absolutely perfectly true of me. I, I know that uh, that's why I would never in a million years send uh, a, an article to an academic journal or send a book to an academic press without giving it as a seminar three or four times. Never in a million years would I do that because I know that I don't really understand it until I try to explain it to somebody else. Well, these essay assignments are like that. They're not as good as trying to teach it, because the trying to teach it part gives you all this wonderful instant feedback. Uh, you know, it's embarrassing to realize in the middle of the class that you really don't understand what you're talking about. But when you get to be as old as I am, you learn how to fake it, you know? <laughs> but the, the important fact here is think of these short essay assignments uh, as, as a substitute for the students actually giving the lectures in the class in a certain sense. Um, it's a way that they try on a very specific question succinctly to say, what is this all about? What's the right way to think about it? And then you give them feedback and say, yeah, you got this part right, but no, you didn't get that part right. Okay, so that's the, that's the very first part. Um, the solidify understanding, precision of expression. And then, of course, the, the third one, which is implicit in the Gerhard Casper story um, the, and implicit in the uh, literature professor who's the chairman of the faculty committee trying to write a report. Um, in our professional lives, in the kinds of professional lives that uh, Stanford students are going to live when they get out there, they are going to be early in their careers, producers of such of the two or three page memo to the CEO that explains the latest catastrophe. And in the second half of their career, they're going to be the ones who are receiving it. All right? <laughs> and that's part of the game is to get them going on that track. I know, it, I know it's uh, considered bad form to talk about Stanford undergraduate, uh, undergraduate degrees as pre-professional degrees. But the reality is, in the contemporary job market, they are. And uh, this is an extremely important skill for students to have. OK. So the non-research paper story then uh, does what I would say is two of the three things a term paper does. Um, it allows them to demonstrate their knowledge. 
but in a much more economical way that doesn't absorb all their time. And it does give you the opportunity to teach them writing skills that, are the, that mimic the modes of communication in the discipline covered by the course or the topic covered by the course. Now, I'm, I mentioned briefly how does one get ideas for these things, and I want to go into that in a little bit more detail. Because I find that, that the hardest single part of my task isn't writing the assignment. Uh, once I've decided what it's about, I, you'll, you'll see some of these. I'm going to talk you through a couple of these. They're kind of fun. Uh, but the hardest part is, so what's a good question? All right, and um, so what do I do? Well, I, I have a very peculiar way of reading the newspaper every day and reading the New Yorker and reading Atlantic Monthly, uh, reading The Economist. Uh, when I'm reading these popular publications, I'm constantly looking for Howley, looking for completely serious, straightforward attempts to explain something that just go way off track. And that's where I start. All right? um, and, and the reason for it is simple. If you're reading the sort of upper crust of journalism, the best news magazines, uh, the best uh, magazines in the category of the New Yorker and Atlantic Monthly, uh, the very best newspapers, those people are really smart. Right? The people who are writing those articles are really, really smart. And for the most part, not completely, they're pretty good writers. So when they go off the deep end, something is seriously wrong, right? Uh, and uh, so it's a great thing to do. I, I, find I, I find about a howler a day in the New York Times. I don't know. One of the, things that, one of the great advantages of being an economist who does public policy is that, uh, you know, something like once a week, there's an article in the New York Times about something that I actually know something about, right? As contrasted to I'm ignorant about <laughs> most of the news stories, I'm just like you, right? Uh, I'm, I don't actually have any direct knowledge of what's it like to be a foot soldier in Iraq. All I can do is read descriptions of it by journalists. Uh, but you, there, for every single person in this room, there's going to be a handful of New York Times articles uh, every month that are right at what you do. Even if you're a theoretical physicist, uh, you know, there's, uh, it, there's somewhere in the New York Times, there's going to be an article where you actually understand what they're writing about, and you know at least as much and probably more than the reporter knew. And I have found uh, that I don't think I've ever read a New York Times article that purported to describe the issues at stake, you know, some policy issue that I knew about that actually got it all right. There's always something missing. There's always a misstatement of the facts. Uh, there's always some argument that is illogical. Uh, the conclusions don't follow from the assumptions. And, and, that's the, and the main reason for it, of course, is that they, they don't have the time. Right? They're writing on a deadline. They're trying to do something really complicated. They just take their best shot at it. And as long as they can show their editor that two telephone calls seem to have said this, uh, they're home free. Right. <laughs> well, that's a great way to motivate students, is to come into class and say, this week your essay assignment is about, well, what am I going to pass you out? Uh, one of these is from the New York Times, by the way. I'll, I'll, I'll deal with the one that I'm passing out, um, about should women have mammograms. Remember that, that issue that came about about two years ago? Uh, this, in, this huge set of articles started appearing in newspapers about reevaluate. There's an old scientific study that has lots and lots and lots of women in it, from about 20 to 25 years old. Um, and it turns out almost all of the epidemiological research on the clinical value of mammograms comes from replowing this same data set. And the reason is it's huge. It's like 50,000 people. They follow 50,000 people for several years and use that to try to figure out uh, are there things associated with the propensity to have breast cancer? And then uh, what, what is the relationship between the ability to detect and cure breast cancer uh, with respect to the frequency with which you have mammograms? And uh, so we've had now about 20 years' worth of research on this same data set. And the research that was reported in the New York Times and other newspapers 
almost exactly two years ago, in the fall of 2001, was, was wonderful grist for me, and would be wonderful grist for somebody teaching a course in biology or statistics as well as economics. Because the person who was writing the article, on the one hand, was taking the best possible shot at getting it right. But on the other hand, it was clinical trials and statistics and uh, mechanisms within cells and all this stuff. You know, you'd have to have three PhDs to be able to understand in complete exquisite detail everything that was going on in these studies. So uh, as a result, it was a joke. And so I start off the process by reading the howlers, reading the things that an undergraduate who has just taken a course in decision theory, is in the middle of taking a course in decision theory, who knows something about statistics, who knows something about the economics of medical care, because that's part of my course, would at that moment in time find them just hilarious, right? Well, that's a great motivator because it, it, it tells the students, hey, you know, here's a nice confidence builder for you. There's this long article in the New York Times that went on for two entire pages with no advertising. It was a huge article. And there are several mistakes in it that you wouldn't have made. All right. Now, here's your essay assignment, which contains some of the information that was misused in this article, but I'm not telling you what. You figure it out and write, write the two or three pages that fixes this problem. Right? Well, needless to say, that's, they like that kind of stuff, right? That's real-world application of biology and statistics and economics all wrapped up in something of sufficient importance. It produced first a, a first-page story in the New York Times, and then secondly, a follow-on story that took up two entire pages, right? Two entire pages in the New York Times, incidentally, is like 40 manuscript pages. It's huge. Okay. So that, that's the, that, is, that is my source of motivation. Uh, and again, no matter what you're doing, you know, you, no matter what field you're in, there's going to be things like that in the, in the high-class popular press. And don't use the low-cost popular press. I started off using National Enquirer, but it's just too easy. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so that, that, that's the first part of the story. Um, th then the, the second part of the story is there. I, uh, sometimes I am forced to actually go find more information, uh, either in the scholarly literature or in, or in government data sets. But I try to minimize that. I, I do it. I always. I, I shouldn't say minimize because minimize would equal zero. But I try to be very narrow and very focused so as not to make the problem too complex. All right. So there'll be two or three things maybe that are facts and figures or uh, uh, theoretical arguments, something like that, taken out of the literature, but they're actually specific and targeted on the project, on the, on the focus. Now, as you see, what I've done is I've really done a lot of the work we normally expect students to do in writing a term paper. We normally expect students to read the literature and figure out what's the relevant thing to use. We normally expect students to go out and gather data, and if that's the nature of the assignment, and put it into the paper. Basically, what I'm doing is that I'm doing that for them. I might add that um, it would be bravery beyond the call of duty uh, to do this in the number of times that I assign essays in my class. I assign biweekly essays, as, as I said before. Plus, in addition to that, I assign three final projects. Uh, the final projects are longer versions of the same thing. The essays. I tell them to hold it to three pages. And I won't read past, past the bottom of page three using 12-point font, uh, double space. You have to specify. Because if you just said three pages, then a Stanford student would figure out you can get an awful lot using four-point font and single spacing. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to just say, I'm only reading three pages, and that's the end. Um, and then the, uh, the final project at the end, which actually the, uh, the mammogram story, which I'll show you, was a final project. So that one, they, they are allowed to go to 1,500 words. But that's still really short, right? That's on the that's five or six pages. And uh, the, the idea of these things is 
narrow, focused question, a lot of information about it, separate from the wheat or the chaff, and, uh, uh, and go for it. Now, I have had, I think, a bigger turnout than I anticipated. Um, I probably should have sold tickets. Uh, so I think I only brought uh, 30 of these. Uh, you want to? Oh, you, you want to do this, bro? Oh, here. Um, see what we can do here. Oh, here's another one. Here, you look like a hungry <laughs> for knowledge. Uh, I'm including the um, the descriptions I have of the essay questions uh, that, that's passed out at the beginning of the quarter. <laughs> You'll notice I. I have these things numbered. I, I, uh, in going through here, summing for things to, to show you, I stopped at essay question number 29. <laughs> I have a file of all the essays I've ever created throughout my whole teaching career, and I recycle them. All right, That's what I meant about if, I, if you're giving biweekly assignments throughout the quarter, which means four, since you can't do anything the first week, uh, given the idiotic Stanford shopping system, <laughs> uh, so that gives you basically four assignments plus three final projects. Um, so you, you, are, you, I can't do seven in a quarter. It's, uh, so what I do is recycle them at the frequency of about once every five years. That requires a little of a bit of updating. But uh, uh, so I, what I have now is a stock of about 40 of these, which the students see seven of them every year. Maybe two or three of them will be new, and the rest will be recycled. So the stock keeps growing, and then. The numbers here are just the numbering system I have in this, in this printout. So just to go through, I have the, uh, the first final project I gave in the winter of 2002, which is the mammograms one. And the reason I picked that one was because it's interdisciplinary in character. All right. um, there's a description at the beginning of what the final project assignment is. And then this other one is the, the, this book of essay questions, the front piece of that. One of the things I do with for the students, actually, what I do is um, I give them all of the essay questions I've ever given as uh, things to use to study for tests. And sometimes I have them do problems in the essays without writing the, without writing the assignment. So some of them are basically perform a policy analysis, but one of the things I can do with it is just make it a homework problem and not an essay. So what they, one of the things they can get on the web is my entire list of essay questions. And then as the term progresses, I give them specific assignments from that. So I let them all read all of them if they want to. And if they have particular interests, they can, they can read some facts about some things. In any case, let me, let me first go through the, 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 what, are, what are a couple of points here. The, in this essay question description, this, the second sentence, is the crucial one. Imagine that the assignment is to write a memo to a bright but not necessarily very well informed decision maker in the government. That may seem an oxymoron, I know. <laughs> um, but in, that's, that's the, that is the assignment. That's what differentiates it from the standard way we do term papers and the, and the standard homework assignment, right? What you're really trying to get students to do in most assignments is be little used, right? They're, they're showing you how to solve a, a problem in your discipline. And if they're going to write it in words, they're, they're writing it sort of as junior professor to senior professor, right? As budding professor to accomplished professor. That's, that's the way we sort of think about term papers. A really great term paper is one where we tell a student, you know, you're two drafts away from submitting this to a professional journal. Right? Well, that's different than this. Right? This is uh, you know, the Gerhard Casper story. A very bright, well-informed, intelligent person who is not very knowledgeable about the specific topic, but who can follow a good, well-documented logical argument about anything, who's capable of picking up a good book on theoretical physics for, that's a pop science book, or a good book on literary criticism, or a good book on economics, doesn't matter what it is, written well for a popular audience, a sort of well-informed layman, and getting a lot out of it, and moreover, being able to evaluate it, being able to say, yeah, I like this argument, or no, I don't. It makes sense or it doesn't. That's the audience. The audience is not the professor. The audience is a mythical other person. All right. 
So, <coughs> and then the second part is the second sentence is deal with this point I said before. Um, the uh, point I make to the students is you have to do the best possible job of stripping your own values from it. And for some of them, it's really hard. Uh, and, uh, and it doesn't matter where they are in the ideological spectrum. You know, it's just really, really hard to get someone to write without revealing what they really feel about something. And uh, that's not going to be as hard in a science class, of course. But in a humanities class or a social science class, the, the students are very prone to have strongly held views about how the world should work. And they want to tell you those views. And uh, that's not what you, what I want, or what I think you should want in these, in these uh, assignments. Notice, uh, with regard to the final projects, the uh, the story here in the write-up that is important uh, to state is that um, they're explicitly told not to do any additional research, and if we uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a question here. If you read number 29, counting the votes, um, you'll notice in the first paragraph I say, please forget everything you have ever read on this issue. This is about Clinton v. Gore. Okay? So the entreaty is, everything I want in your essay, uh, excuse me, Bush v. Gore. Yeah. This is about the 2000 presidential election. And it is, I want you to assume that the only relevant facts are the ones in this one page. Nothing else. All right? <laughs> and uh, so in, in many of these cases, this is a problem I would have more, I think, than some of you. Um, if, you're, if, you're assigning, um, an assi if you're making an assignment that's dealing with something that's widely debated in the past and is a matter of public discourse, something they talk about in their dorms with their, with their compatriots, um, it, they'll know a hell of a lot more about it than you would ever want them to know for the purpose of writing a three-page essay, right? And so you have to be very, very clear. Don't bring in extraneous information, no matter how truthful it is and no matter how relevant it is, because that gets at this issue. I want them to be focusing on the short, brief, to the point exposition as contrasted to the comprehensive analysis we might do in a research paper, all right? So that's, that's sort of the main lesson there about how we build these essays. So in any case, for your amusement and potential um, uh, inspiration, I hope, uh, there are several of these questions here. Um, the mammogram question will migrate from a final project question in 2002 to an essay assignment sometime in the future. Uh, with updated information from subsequent rounds of the debate, since it's still not over. Incidentally, the issue of at what age should women start to get regular mammograms, if you go out into the medical community, you'll still get 20-year differences in the answers you get from physicians. And uh, um, interestingly enough, there's enough information in this for you to be able to give them the right answer <laughs> <laughs> as to when they should start getting regular mammograms. Even though, the, and then the reason, of course, for it is that most doctors don't know how to process statistical information, and, they, and there's some non-obvious statistics <laughs> in this problem. Okay, so that that basically is my formal presentation. Um, this is, you know, this is my proud product. It also gets put on my course website if you ever want to go look look for more. Uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions in the few minutes we have left. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm curious about one essay that I deal with and the problem students have with it, very similar to what you're talking about. It's the uh, uh, foreign policy uh, essay for the Carnegie, uh, yes. uh, where regularly students don't realize that they're being asked to formulate a policy opinion, and they end up writing a report. Uh, uh, what about U.S. policy in Iraq? Uh, the latest, one of the latest ones is, of course, or democratization in Ukraine, or, you know, and it would be, uh, or uh, uh, the Chinese Communist Party in relationship to development, et cetera, and, 
they would end up giving, well, this side thinks this, and that side thinks this, and that side thinks this, okay? Yeah. So I'm one, and I then... That's the standard New York Times approach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm asking what they actually really think. But, uh, uh, so usually I have to kick them in the butt to say you're supposed to actually write an opinion here. What is your opinion? So number one, they're not used to formulating opinions. They're used to trying stepping back and trying to be quote unquote academic. And then the other aspect of it, and I'm curious about what you said about don't bring in your moral or your, your worldview into the stance uh, of it, or what, what you said is don't do it explicitly. Uh, it's well, no, no, if you're going to do it, you have to do it explicitly. What I, what I, no, no, I mean, yeah, but implicitly yeah. you do implicitly have a, a worldview. Implicitly you do, that's right. right, and it's hard to... But you don't, okay. you don't pontificate about exactly. you're right. well, why you're right and they're wrong. Yeah. And then in that particular question, for example, it doesn't say who you're writing to, and it doesn't say what perspective you're writing from. Exactly. They usually make the assumption they're writing from the perspective of the U.S. State Department, mm -hmm. whereas I said to the, some students, why don't you write it from the perspective of the Iraqi resistance. Have you thought of that? I mean, that may not be their perspective, right? And so all of this comes across as a kind of a trick essay assignment of which there are a lot of skills along the way that they need to, to develop. So I'm wondering, you know, obviously in this essay assignment you're trying to get them to this public policy opinion. Right. But, you know, how do you, you know, what's the jump start? Well, that, I mean, that's an excellent question. And, um, First, the, the, what I'm trying to teach them not to do is I have an opinion. Let's think of the least implausible way to justify it. <laughs> uh, which is the standard, that's the standard of political rhetoric. The standard of political rhetoric is uh, I've been a politician for 20 years. I've been, 20 years I've been taking a position on this issue. I can't possibly say anything other than what I've been saying all along. So let's look for the best conceivable way to continue to justify something to which I have adhered. That's what I'm trying to train out of them. And that's what they frequently bring to me at the beginning, beginning of the quarter. Not all of them, but I'd say 25, 30%. That's the way they start the course. Your, your, I think the point you make is, is excellent. That if we think about um, most, of, most of these essay assignments that they will be writing, through for fellowships, for some forms of graduate admission, not all. Admission to law school is a good example. Um, they are supposed to have a point of view. But the crucial fact, of course, is the point of view is supposed to be presented uh, in sort of a coherent, uh, logical way, where they're saying, here, here are my assumptions, and here is what I know about the world, and here's the conclusions that derive from this, and here are the things See, one of the things that I, when I'm doing the same thing you are, I, I, I frequently have to read the first draft of these things. Yeah. And um, one of the things that I tell them to do is if you come to a spot where you really don't know, then say it and say what information you'd need to solve that <coughs> part of it. And I, cause I, I think that, that uh, a lot of the things that I read, some, some of my assignments are actually of that form. They are design the research project that would solve the puzzle. Here's a bunch of information. What are the additional facts you would have to have in order to reach a policy conclusion and to make a <coughs> policy recommendation um, that you don't have? All right. And I think that's that um, that's a neat way, and, and and thus far, according to my experience, a fairly successful way of getting past these essay assignments is. Um, you know, sure, have a point of view, but have it be a point of view that is defended in a sort of non-emotive, uh, uh, non-political way. And, and, I, and, and I agree, there's nothing worse than the, uh, you know, that I have two sources on each of three points of view, and here's what they are. I mean, that is, that, that, if when students do that to me, I do the same thing that you would do. I say, no, this doesn't work. It's usually that. Yeah. Rather than I've got a point of view and I'm yeah. going to ram it down your throat. Type thing. It's usually I'm um, trying to be balanced and show you all sides of something that they don't reach a point. And that may be a function of people who are doing international relations and want to go into the Foreign Service or something like that. <laughs> um, see, I, what I get. You have to write a policy memo to yeah. the State Department, to the head of their, 
to say but I get in Armin, I get Armin to, to are absolutely committed to something about environmental policy. And a lot of my questions are on environmental policy for exactly that reason. Because I know they already have the conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> right? And I want them, I'm trying to force them away from it, you know. And uh, uh, I mean, my, my greatest success actually in my class ever, this is my single greatest accomplishment in my class, was I had a, an extremely ardent environmentalist take my class. Uh, he hated economics, but his roommate convinced him that he, that he had to know the enemy. And so he, <laughs> he, took, he took the prerequisites for my class just to take my class. He's now an assistant professor of economics at Duke. Because <laughs> he discovered that economics wasn't anti-environment, right? That, it, that, it, that, it, that the prejudice he had about it was wrong. The opinions he had were wrong. Uh, he completely, he said, aha, this is another tool I can use. <laughs> and uh, so that, that's, I think that's, the, that's what you try to do uh, for those, in those areas. Um, and I think that, that things, certain things about distributive justice, health care policy, environmental policy, uh, you're, uh, and I suspect even the war, war in Iraq for people who have no desire to go into international relations as a field mm -hmm. is hot buttoning. And, and so my problem as I see it is somewhat different than yours, but I think they're compatible. Part question. The first is, could you say a little bit about uh, the time uh, and uh, the time load here for you and, and anybody else that's working for you as an assistant, teaching assistant, or whatever? Do you do all of this oh, yourself? Yeah. And, oh, okay. And, 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 and uh, my dear friend Claude gives me enough money to have extra TAs. <laughs> <laughs> no, not that much. I have. Um, I have. Uh, the economics department does not provide adequate TAs to teach courses that have essay assignments of the size of my class. My class typically has an enrollment of 80, and uh, the economics well, department. To do these kinds of this kind of feedback on essays every week for everybody, uh, 80 people would be a fairly substantial. Uh, exactly. And so what I what I do is I I have one TA from the economics department, one TA from public policy, and one TA from Claude. Mm -hmm. So among four people, we divide the work among. And the other is, uh, other question is, did did the uh, did the nature of the course change at all uh, after it, you did this, and then you and then it became a whim, right? Yeah, well, did actually, it change when it became a whim. I'm very it? proud of the fact that whim is me. All right, my, the, the the basic structure of how whim works. Uh, there were a bunch of us around campus that were already doing whim before there was whim, and the whim program is a generalization of what we do. So it didn't you didn't change anything at all. Uh, 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 my class is, my, the, the basic structure of my class is actually more than is required on a WIM course. Then uh, just a quick, quick follow up to that. Is, is there any, is there any, uh, I mean, some of us try, have, how much substance are you teaching in the class <coughs> along with all of these uh, techniques? It's a substance class. It is a, the substance of the class is the second semester course in economic policy analysis taught in the master's program at Kennedy School. So in 10 weeks, we cover what the Kennedy School covers in 15. Uh, so it's a very intense course in the methodology of economic policy analysis, benefit cost analysis, risk analysis, uh, statistical decision theory applied to the public sector. And uh, so the, it's a very, very rigorous class. And that's why I had to think really seriously about factoring in the writing in a reasonable time frame. Right, because it's like that's why I, I was sort of pitching what I was saying uh, a lot to the science and engineering people because that's the way their courses are, right? And uh, so I, I, my main goal here in my course isn't the writing component. My main goal is that these students, I mean, frankly, my students can get jobs and consulting firms and government agencies doing policy analyses in competition with graduates of the Kennedy School. And so they don't have to get the master's degree to get the job. All right. And uh, so I have a, a quasi-professional technological goal from my class. And uh, the writing part has to be something I can squeeze in on top of that. Uh, 
uh, in what is already an intense course. And frankly, um, from student feedback, um, that, they really like that. They, they much prefer writing assignments in real courses to writing courses. All right? I mean, that, that, that's the intriguing thing is that they, they, uh, they really like to sit down and spend a couple of hours writing about what they learned this week. Um, if you, if you, you, you know, and, and, and so my students, they, 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 the public policy majors call the winter of their junior year the quarter from hell, all right? <laughs> and the reason it's the quarter from hell is because they have to take three courses that are incredibly time consuming, one of which is mine. And, but they all come out of it saying, this is great because it integrated this technical material into other real things and allowed us to write this stuff, right? And that that was important, first of all, to solidify our own understanding of the course, but also to make it real. And, and we got to write about something that, that was important to us as opposed to something that was important to the teacher, you know, that worked as, and that, I think that, that is the, um, uh, a really good general theorem. It, putting writing into courses that don't look like writing courses is a great idea. It's not, it's not a, some sort of peripheral thing you're doing to satisfy an institutional requirement. I think it's a really good idea. Yeah? I certainly agreed with your statement that high quality writing in a specific discipline can look very different than yeah. high quality writing in a freshman English course. Yeah. Um, how do you go about giving them a picture of what that writing should look like, what they're aiming for, particularly if what you're giving them as research is your summary rather than papers written in that? absolutely great. Fortunately, being an economist, I have access to things that you don't have. All right. For, uh, the uh, Brookings Institution, the American Enterprise Institute, the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research have all produced things called policy briefs, which are things that are two to five pages long that summarize a policy issue. I assign them. Uh, I assign two or three a week for the first half of the course. And, it, and, it, and they're, they're connected to, to the course, but the, the main purpose of assigning these is to give them examples. The second thing I do is I've written some of these things myself. And uh, I have the students read them. I have some handouts early in the course. You'll notice by the handout that I passed out here that um, my questions are like business school case studies, right? Some of these questions are two or three pages long, single spaced. And they are essays, right? And the, the point of it, of that, is by example, to show it. That's why I think that, you know, the burden on the instructor here is, in the short term, very great. Fortunately, you can spread it over lots of years. But, um, you do have, one of the things you have to do is reveal yourself in a certain sense. You have to do it yourself and show the students what you did and try to provide an example for them. And, uh, so I, I have them read policy briefs that I have written either for Seifer or for Brookings. And then I write some of my essay questions as if they were incomplete. So they, they get a sense of what I'm after by induction. I think we'll probably have to bring yeah. the official part. I hope you wouldn't mind sticking oh, no, around fine. for a minute or yeah. two if other people have questions. So thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.